I greet you all in the precious name of Jesus. I'm truly humbled uh, to be afforded this opportunity to speak here at uh, Siloam Backbairn. As you know, our topic for this month is the financial fitness fast. And I'm going to unpack today what the Bible says about our finances. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the leadership of Backpan for affording me uh, this opportunity. And the title of my message today is Lettuce, like the vegetable, lettuce. Yeah. So when Pastor Adrian asked me to speak today, he asked me to share my testimony. So that's where I'll start, right? So growing up, uh, a little bit about myself and my families, we weren't very well off financially. You know, we grew up in a township. My dad was a, was a postman, and my mom didn't work for, for most of her life. So our entire life was us being in very difficult situations, not having enough to meet ends, ends meet by the end of the month. But every month, God came through. And so in my entire life, I saw the cycle of us living in houses we can't afford, cars we can't afford, but every month, God coming through. So when I had finished university, I had gotten in a job as, as an engineer. And so the first thing I did was I bought my parents a house in the suburbs, and I bought myself a car to the maximum of what I could afford, right? Because that's typically what you do as soon as you get a little bit of money. And then I got married. And when I got married, I was living in Durban. My wife was living in Johannesburg. So I was trying to get a job up here, and it wasn't coming through. So we decided it's not good for us to live apart. So my wife resigned. We decided she'll resign and move down to Durban, and we'll get a place of our own in Durban. But now I knew that financially I could not afford this because I've, ha I've had the other bond, I had my car installment, and now I'm going to go get another place. It was unaffordable. But I saw how God worked in my parents' life, and I knew he'll do the same for me. So I told her we moved down, and we're going to live by faith. And true to his word, God came through every month. Don't ask me how. God came through every month. But what I didn't learn from my parents is how God chooses to come through. In the last minute of the last day, at the end of the month, and that whole week before month end, I'd have palpitations. I couldn't sleep, thinking about how am I going to pay my expenses. And, you know, this used to result in Jerody and I having very silly arguments, right? And I'm going to share one of the arguments today. But to understand, you've got to understand, I said my background is I come from a township like farm area. So we bought our fruit and vegetables from a market, right? Whereas my wife, she grew up in Johannesburg in the suburbs, so she, went, she used to buy from a grocery store. So the one day I come home, and we're struggling, we're, not, we're struggling to meet our budget, and I come home and Jerody's opened this packet, pre-packed packet of lettuce. <laughs> and I have a fight to her because I'm like, I can buy lettuce for three rand in the market, and you are going and buying this pre-packed lettuce. And that's when I realized something was wrong. We were fighting over 20 rand. From the outside, if you looked at me, I looked very wealthy. I had my parents' house in the suburbs, I was living in Durban North, and I bought a brand new Audi A4, but I was fighting over lectures. <laughs> I, was, I was struggling, and that's when I realized I didn't own any of it. The bank owned everything, and I was giving the bank my large salary to appear wealthy when, in fact, I was broke. Having money wasn't the problem. How I was spending the money I had was. That's when I decided to see what the Bible says about finances. Because I always wanted to listen to the messages that spoke to me, right? So we live by faith and not by sight. Give and it'll be given, pressed down, shaken together and running over. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. I honestly felt by getting into debt, I was creating need for God to supply. And it worked. He was supplying. But why was I this unhappy? Surely I was missing something. Surely God's plan for my life was to be joyous and not continually, continuously stressed. That's when I stopped selectively listening to the, the things that tickle my ears, and I saw what the Bible says holistically about money. The first thing I looked at is what it said about debt, because that's what I was drowning in, debt. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible doesn't say debt is a sin anywhere, but the Bible doesn't have anything good to say about debt. In Proverbs 22, 7, it says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Deuteronomy 15.6 says, For the Lord your God will bless you as he's promised. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessings of the Lord make it one rich, and adds no sorrow with it. I was going through a lot of sorrow, so all the things I had could not be blessings. 
Basically, I can see that God doesn't want his children to be in debt. But the debt-free scriptures to me seem contradictory to the prosperity message because it involved planning and budgeting. For example, Luke 14, 28, 29 says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation he is not able to finish and all will begin to mock him. I ask myself, where is the faith aspect? By creating this budget, am I not relying on my own strength? So I said, let me look at what the Bible says about prosperity. And this is my key scripture, 2 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read verse 6 and verse 10. Verse 6 says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. And whoever sows generously, reaps generously. If I go to verse 10, it says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. You will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. This was confusing me because prosperity refers to giving freely, while debt-free means being thrifty and saving, or so I thought. Then it dawned on me. Debt holds you in so much bondage that you are unable to give as freely as you would like to because you have all these installments you need to pay. But once you have financial freedom, you are able to freely give as you freely receive. The word says he gives seed to the sower and will multiply your store of seed. The seed represents what you give away. If you keep using what God has given you to get into more and more debt, you will not have seed to sow and hence nothing to reap. But when you have financial freedom, it's easier to give because it has no impact on your quality of life. And for most of us, it's a joyous thing to give when we have an abundance. And this is supported by the parable of ta the talents, right? The one who was most productive received more, and the one that was least productive, even what he had, was taken away from him. I had to ask myself, are you taking what God has given you and losing it to debt? Or are you being a wise steward of God's money? Matthew 25, 27 says, Then you ought to have invested my money to with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received my own with interest. God is telling you invest. The scripture says the kingdom of heaven is like this. He's telling you invest. Don't put money into something costing you interest when you should be earning interest. And that's when I realized the prosperity message isn't contradictory to the debt-free message or saving message. They are mutually inclusive and must be done together. To be able to give freely, you cannot have debt hanging over your head. You become a wise steward by becoming debt-free so you'll be able to freely give as you freely receive. Amen? I was freely giving to the bank and unable to freely give anywhere else. I was happy to pay interest and create an external image of prosperity, but internally I was fighting my wife over lettuce. And that's the story of how I decided to get debt free. It took me years of sacrifice. When we started this uh, process, my wife and I uh, I got the job in, in Joburg and progressed into senior management and then eventually directorship. She was at management level at the bank, but we lived in a two-bedroom flat. And we saved, it was well below our means, we saved every bonus, every extra income. We cut our holidays, restaurants. We were just determined to get debt-free. And we did, we basically did the financial fitness fast for five years. And five years later, we were debt-free. Thank you. And it should have taken us longer, but I think God saw the way we were stewarding our finances and an increase and acceleration began to come. In fact, when we started the church, Siloam Santon at our house, uh, which was now six years post the lettuce incident, that was the year I got completely debt free. So there was that spiritual aspect of it. So now I've done the five years of the financial fitness fast. It worked in my life. So today I'm going to use my experience and show you how the average person, if he does the financial fitness fast for five years, can also be wealthy and leave an inheritance for his kids. The thing I was challenged about in this message was that we think to be debt-free, you have to earn a lot of money. But how does the average person leave an inheritance for their children? How does the average salary earner become wealthy? Being an, an engineer and an analytical person, I believe that science proves how God operates, as opposed to how many scientists try to disprove God. 
For example, when God said, let there be light, he didn't switch the light on every day and then switch the light off every night. He created a solar system with the planets revolving around the sun with principles that it follows so that he doesn't have to worry about switching the light on and off every day. It does it by itself. In a similar vein, I believe if we just follow the, the principles of the, of the Bible, we should also be able to get this generational wealth. So if God's principles are true, by following them, even the average earner should be able to follow the principles and be wealthy. And that's the plan. I this, that's what I plan to prove mathematically today. It's not a money falling from the sky moment. It's applying practical biblical principles to in, in everyday life in order to receive God's promises. We're going to put you through the financial fitness fast. <laughs> so let's talk. Now we're going to talk about the numbers, right? Let me introduce you to Mr. Average and Mr. Debt Free. Mr. Average represents the average South African, right? Mr. Debt Free represents a person that's undergoing the financial fitness fast. All right? So let's work out what Mr. Average is. What is the average South African? So all of my assumptions that I'm using today is not guesses. It's from statistical data, from stats essay, and my good friend Google. Right? So we're going to start off by understanding what is the average salary of a South African living in Johannesburg. So to discover that, I went to a a uh, website called Payscale, and according to Payscale, the average salary for a South African is 280,000 rand a year. We then need to factor in inflation, right? And the reason I'm factoring inflation is to determine the net present value, which basically means what will the, the money be worth today? So for example, a million rand 20 years ago well, could have bought you a lot more things than a million rand today can buy you. That's why bread was a few cents then, and now bread is like 15 rand. So the numbers, when I share the net present value, you can compare what is that value of money in today's money, right? So for inflation, I went to um, Statistica, and inflation in South Africa is just under 5%, so we'll use 5% to be conservative. And then the last thing I Googled was what is the interest rate you can expect to earn um, for over 20 years, and the, the value I got is 12.5% from tradingeconomics.com. Right, so everything's um, proven data. What do you think I could get the average earner earning 23,000 rand a month to retire with, assuming he starts saving at 25 and retires at 65? And remember, I've not increased his salary at all. He's going to earn 23,000 for the rest of his life. 76,776,000. Does that surprise you? With 23,000, that is your earning potential which in today's money is 19 million rand, today's money. You'll see I've got a number below that, right? That's a potential salary, someone that if he takes 5% interest, right, he can take a salary of 79,000 rand a month and never touch his capital because inflation is 5%, he's earning 12%, he's, he's taking out less money than inflation. So his capital always grows, right? That's what the average person can do. But the sad reality is 94% of the population do not have sufficient savings. Only 6 in 100 people have enough money to retire comfortably. You can go to the next slide. And why is this the case? It's because of debt and living beyond your means. So now I'm sure you're interested, okay, this number sound great, but how did I do it, right? So now we're going to do a practical example together of how we can take the average person and make him sa save 76 million rand. So we're going to start by understanding how the average South African spends his money. So to determine that, I, I went on to um, Stats SA. So Stats SA has done a census of all the South Africans and developed this pie chart of how a South African spends their money. Based on this, I took his average salary of 23,000 and I created a budget. If we can go to the next slide. So based on his expenditure, the average South African earning 23,000 rand a month pays about 8,500 rand for his house, about 4,000 rand for his car, about 3,000 rand for goods and services. I've added tithe because you need seed in order to, to get blessed. And then other. Other represents groceries, eating out, that kind of thing. Right? So that's what his monthly budget of the average South African is going to be. So Mr. Average comes to me and he says to me, I want to be Mr. Debt Free. 
I'll say to him, okay, let's see how we can manage that same budget, because that's all the money you have, and still be able to do the things you need to do, but still be able to save money. So let's see what the Bible says, firstly, when you're in this problem of debt. In Proverbs 6, 1 to 7, it says, If you have signed surety, my son, do this. Give no sleep to your eyelids, no slumber to your eyes, and deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. The Bible is saying, if you have debt, do whatever it takes to get out of debt. As soon as possible. Make all the sacrifices you need to make. Be as comfortable as you need to be, but get debt free. So taking that budget of, that he has, I looked at what kind of house you buy. Can we go new, two slides on? I know I'm going a bit faster than my notes. Um, so at that budget, I looked, my pastor is from Benoni, Pastor Reynolds, and I know he stays in Rhinefield. So that's the only area in Benoni I know. So I looked in, in Rhinefield. He can afford about an 875,000 rand house. That translates to a two-bedroom house in Rhinefield. I'm going to say, okay, you're not going to spend 8,500 rand on that bond. I want you to rent. So you'll rent still a two-bedroom apartment in Rhinefield, right? But now you're paying 5,500 rand instead of the 8,500 rand bond, and you're not paying levies, you're not paying rates. The next thing I'm going to do, and this is going to be a hard, a hard one for the gents, is I'm going to say, okay, your car. You can afford a 160,000 rand car when you're four grand a month, which translates to a polo. I'm going to say, sorry, but you got 30,000 rand. Right? It's a car, it does the job, it'll get you where you need to go. That will drop his car installment to 835 rand. So if I look at his budget now, oh, and on that 5,000 rand extra for eating out and that, it's financial fitness fast. I, I don't know the word you use, Pastor Adrian, but none of that. <laughs> so I'm going to take 1,000 rand from that. So I'm still going to give him 4,000 odd rand. I'm just taking 20%, 1,000 rand, right? That gives me a saving of 3,000 on his car. 3,000 in the house and 1,000, so it's about 7,300 rand total is what I'm saving. That 7,300 is all I need to save him 76 million rand. And you'll agree, I've not done anything dangerous. He's still living in a two-bedroom house. He's still driving a car he can get to work. All I need, all I, if I just take that 7,300 rand and I put it into a fixed deposit earning 12% for 40 years, he'll get 76 million rand, which is... Uh, we said 20 million rand in today's money, okay? So, you know, this is what uh, one of my favorite speakers on the subject, Dave Ramsey, calls being gazelle intense, doing whatever you need to do to get out of debt. So this is realistic, but it's not practical. You know, this shows you what's possible. It's practical, but it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's possible, but it's not practical, right? So let's see practically what we can get this guy to do, right? So I'm going to say to the guy, look, I did this fast for five years. So I'm going to say, you give me five years of your life, like I did five years. Let's see what we can achieve, okay? So he's only going to do the fast for me, uh, or this sacrifice that we've done for five years. So at the end of five years, I'm going to give him his thousand rand back, right? Now to make him compare himself to Addy being average, starting at 25, I need him to have that same 900,000 rand house and drive the same 150,000 rand car. So, because, he's, um, because of that, he's been saving for the last five years, he hasn't had a bond and car, that extra money has been in the savings. In that savings, in that five years, he would have saved 628,000 Rand in net present value, in the today's money, right? So, he'll buy that 150,000 Rand car cash, and he'll put 500,000 Rand deposit into the, into the bond for that 900,000. So now he's living in the exact same house, he's driving the exact same car as he would have had he been average, right? But I'm going to say, okay, that bond installment and the car that he had from his budget of the 8,500 and the 4,000 rand, he's going to pay extra into his bond, all right? How long do you think it's going to take him to pay off that 900,000 rand bond? Three years. In three years, he'll be, his bond will be free, right? Let's compare him to Addy lived an average life, uh, where he took the bond eight years ago. So now, Mr. Average is paying for his bond for eight years. How much of the bond do you think Mr. Average, of that 900,000 rand bond, you think Mr. Average paid? Or how much do you think he still owes on his bond after eight years? 720,000 rand. He only paid 
180,000 rand of his bond. After eight years, and you would have thought he had a head start because he had a bond for five years more than Mr. Debt Free. Mr. Debt Free only had the bond for three years. But it shows you that it's cheaper for you to save for five years and put a down payment on a house than it is to take a bond and pay it over 20 years. Um, so, so, yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to find my, my notes here. Yeah. So it, it's better to pay off your bond with a, with a down payment and pay extra, so you pay it off on a sh over a short period. So now let's take them both at the age of 45. Let's fast forward to Mr. Average at 45. So Mr. Average took that 900,000 Rand bond for 20 years. That's why we're going to go to, at the age of 45, Mr. Average, assuming he stayed in the same house, freed that bond, right? He's freed the bond, and he's probably driving about a 300,000 Rand, 400,000 Rand car. So I'm going to say to Mr. Average, okay, now he, buy, he can buy a bigger house. So if he buys to the maximum he can afford, he can only afford another 900,000 because I haven't increased the salary, right? So at 45, he'll buy a 1.8 million rand house, and he'll buy like a four or 500,000 rand car. So you can imagine someone earning 23,000 rand a month, he's doing pretty well, he's living in a 1.8 million rand house, driving a half a million rand car. So Mr. Debt Free, to live exactly the same life, let's compare, and I'm not changing any expenses. They're paying the same expenses. I only took the five years. After the five years, he's living the same expenses as Mr. Debt Free, he's just taking what he would have paid in his bond and car installment, and he's putting it in a savings, earning 12% interest, right? At 45, Mr. Debt Free also has the free house and the free car, but he has a cool 2.7 million rand cash in net present value saved. So to make him live the same as Mr. Average, he's gonna buy the 1.8 million rand house, he's gonna buy the 500,000 rand car, but he's gonna buy both cash, so he doesn't have to take a bond. He'll have both cash, and he'll still have a cool 1.3 million rand, just in case there's a rainy 10 years. Fast forward to our, let's fast forward to retirement. Now that's at 45. Uh, they, both got ex at f they both got the same house, same car. Now at, let's fast forward to 65, another 20 years later, right? So now they're at retirement. Mr. Average at 65 can look back at his life with pride. He's got a 1.8 million rand house, cash, freed. He's driving a 500,000 rand car, Freed, cash, right? He's done well, Mr. Average, but he's done well by our standards. Now he needs to retire. What does he do? He has to sell the house and sell the car, right? Because, or he has to keep working to sustain his life. If he sells the house and car and puts it into a retirement fund, maybe he'll get 10,000 Rand a month, and which is still decent. I'm sure at retirement he could probably live with that, right? Let's compare him to Mr. Debt Free. Mr. Debt Free at retirement, right, also has the 1.8 million rand house paid and the 500,000 rand car uh, freed, but he also has a 11.5 million rand cash in the bank to retire with. Just living, all he did was instead of paying the money to the bank on interest on his bond or interest on his car, he paid that and put it in a fixed deposit earning 12% over the, over the period of time. That translates to 11 and a half million rand, which in, that's net present value. In actual money, it's 33 million rand. That's how much money, 33 million rand, is the earning potential that people lose because they pay interest instead of earning interest. All right, I'll let that digest <laughs> for a little bit. Now, if we go back to that, um, uh, to that calculation, right? You'll see at 65, say he's now ready to retire he can earn a salary of 47,000 rand a month at retirement and never touch the capital because I'm only taking 5%. So the capital always increased. So I modeled that if at 65 he retired and he died at 85, right? And at 65, I told him, stop saving. Never save again. You've got enough money, right? Spend your money on your grandchildren. You don't need to save again. At 85, his money still increased to 17 million even though he's been taking out money on interest. That's the beauty of compound interest. You make money from your capital, right? At 85, his salary at retirement is 71,000 rand a month, which means if he died at, at 85, he can pay his children, and assuming he's, an, uh, he's a, the average South African um, a person having two kids, he can pay each child 35,000 rand a month 
for the rest of their life into perpetuity for every generation to come and never touch the capital. In fact, it will always go up. And remember, this is net present value. So it's going up. Um, they're not going up with inflation. It's going up above inflation. All right? That is the earning potential that you can, th that it can achieve. Two people living exactly the same lives, earning average salaries, but one just following biblical principles of getting out of debt and how different the outcome. This is, why God, this is what God wants for our lives, to be financially free. This model doesn't take any favor, increase, or spiritual blessings into account. Once that happens in your life, you start seeing exponential increases, which you won't be able to comprehend. And it's a snowball effect, because when you have money, it's easy to give money. But when you give money, you get money. And it just snowballs, and it just gets more than you can even imagine. And this is what the average person could do if they chose to save rather than get into debt. There's nothing special in the model, no sideline businesses, no extra income or bonuses, not even an increase for 40 years, just following biblical principles of debt-free living. God wants to bless you more than you can contain, but first, can you prove that you're a good steward? Are you using the blessings God has given you to work for you, are you or are you getting into more and more debt, causing it to work against you, and causing you more and more pain and anguish, asking God to constantly bail you out. When you are in that position, it is very difficult to give or be a blessing. That's why he put you on this earth, by the way, to be a blessing and to bless others. I go back to my key scripture. He who gives seed to the sower will increase your store of seed. Are you planting seed and earning interest, or are you depleting it by paying interest? For the young people, this message is, is mostly directed to you. Can we go back to that slide um, uh, before for this one with the, with the cash flows? But basically what you would find is that the money, compound interest escalates exponentially. So the longer you keep it there, the, the better it is, right? The, 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 the more money you earn. So it's easier also for youngsters to make the five-year sacrifice when you just start work. Because most of you are still living with your parents, you don't have children, it's very easy to do the financial freedom fast then. Very difficult to do it after you have kids and those kind of things, right? Still doable, but it just becomes a little bit more difficult and we have to work a little bit more on how we, we reduce those expenses. But I, I just did a quick calculation and I, I don't know if you can pull up my last slide to, to do a comparison of what would, ha what would happen if you saved early versus saving late, all right? So in this model, there's two, two people that saved. The first guy saved from 5,000 rand a month from the age of 25 to 30, and then stopped saving. Only save for five years, right? Save for five years. At the age of 65, in compound interest, his fund is worth 26 million. Then I compared him to someone that started saving at 30. 5,000 rand a month, and saved all the way to 65. So he saved for 35 years, versus the first person only saved for five years. Even saving for 35 years, he's still 10 million rand less than the guy that only saved for five years between 25 and 30. That's the importance of saving early. From a capital point of view, if you save 25, if you save from 25 to 30 years old, you only put in 300,000 rand. And with compound interest over, earned over 45 years, that becomes 26 million. While capital put in between 35 and 65 is 2.1 million rand. In the exact investment, and you get back 16 million. 10 million rand less, only because the money was invested for five years less. It's a lot, it's a lot cheaper to save for retirement when you're young and very expensive when you're old. But that's a topic for another day. I hope you are blessed. Thank you.